Look, it is no secret that first-person shooter enthusiasts are constantly changing their configs. Whether it's your sensitivity, aspect ratio, resolution, video settings, or your freaking view model. It often feels as if our settings are in a constant state of flux, as if screwing up a single frag is enough to overhaul our entire preferential infrastructure from the freaking ground up. But there is nothing that gets subjected to as many endless tweaks as our crosshairs. Big, small, thick, thin, large gap, tiny gap, dynamic, transparent, outlined, or just an absolute monstrosity. Reticles mark the one aspect of our config where there aren't only an inexhaustible variety of options to choose from, but quite literally too many combinations to count. The question, of course, is are crosshairs really as cosmetic as we all think they are? Or does changing them as frequently as we do actually hurt us more than help us? Okay, so first things first, for all of you League of Legends enthusiasts out there, what is a crosshair? A crosshair is the default or custom bespoke reticle that sits dead center in the middle of a player's screen and allows them to, well, aim, direct gunfire, and go clicky clicky boom boom. That's it. Seriously, this one's super straightforward. What may not be so straightforward is why people obsess over them so much. You see, back in the earliest days of FPS, crosshairs were extremely uncommon. Sure, you could stumble upon them in certain arcade games, but when it came to the titles on which the first-person shooter genre was actually built, Wolfenstein 3D, Doom, even Goldeneye, there was nothing. You literally had to intuit where your shots were going to go. In fact, it wasn't really until Half-Life came out in 1998 that crosshairs became a thing on PC. And even then, it was tiny, transparent, impossible to see, and, well, ironically, exactly the kind of thing that kids these days would consider a god crosshair. Here's the crazy thing, though. The first competitive FPS to really usher gaming reticles into the modern era wasn't actually on PC. It was on that accursed, casual, infested hellscape known as console. What was it? Well, it was... Uh... God, I can't believe Colton's gonna have footage of me saying this. It was Halo. You are damn right it was Halo. Combat Evolved was ahead of its time in basically every area, and that includes the reticle. The centered crosshair helped ground the player, since they were able to freely look and move in any direction which was still a new concept to 3D FPS gamers in the early 2000s, especially on a console. The crosshair told you not only where your gun was pointed, but also how that particular gun would fire, like the large circle of the shotgun or small hollow dot and scope for the sniper rifle. Oh, you thought I was done bragging about the most revolutionary FPS ever made? They let me talk about Halo, guys. We're just getting started. When placed over an enemy, the crosshair will turn red only if the player is in range for aim assist with that particular gun. Missing all your shots? Like me? Zooming in extends the aim assist distance of any gun with telescopic zoom. Later, in Halo 2, a small dot was added to the center of the reticle on precision weapons when you were aiming at your enemy's head. Maybe put a little more respect on the OG Halo scene, Dimitri. Story of Halo when? I mean, when there's a story to tell. <laughs> what? Jesus! That was brutal! Now, when you think about it, it actually made a ton of sense for Halo to put such an emphasis on having a baller crosshair. The release of Halo was revolutionary from a multiplayer standpoint, inspiring an entire generation of gamers to take up arms against one another in what was undeniably one of the most formative and foundational PvP experiences across the whole of esports. I'll never forget this. I get like a headshot on Zach, and I'm like, sit the f down. And there's like applause. And I turn around, and there's a group of people who are watching. And now they get it. The multiplayer was the, the thing. Oh my God! Of course, pioneering as it was, Halo still offered a fixed, immutable crosshair. You couldn't change it even if you wanted to. 
it wasn't until the early 2000s began to unfold, and 1FPS in particular started offering tools to rework reticles, that it became clear people wanted to. The advent of Counter-Strike both inspired and enabled players to start tinkering with their reticles as obsessively as they do today. As the professional scene became more prominent, players began copying their favorite competitors' configurations, including their crosshairs. I mean, back in the days, you need to find those weird websites like similar to days, where there's websites specific for like configs. You can download the pro ones and even semi-pro ones and those things. And you can also find like different sizes and different colors on it. Of course, things really began to escalate with the release of CSGO, as crosshair customization became even more intricate. From size, to color, to alpha, to outline, to movement and recoil correctives, crosshairs quickly cemented themselves as the most easily scrutinizable component of one's config. The one thing that you could fiddle and fuss with all the time, since, well, it was cosmetic, right? As it turns out, kind of. You see, while the makeup of one's crosshair and the merits thereof may indeed be subjective, the concept is not. In other words, on-screen reticles carry an immense responsibility, and it isn't just to let you pop heads in the most seamless way imaginable. It's to prevent motion sickness. Or, well, technically it's called simulation sickness since you're not actually moving, but yeah, same idea. Here to explain this phenomenon is Dr. Madison Klarkowski, an expert in human-computer interaction who teaches at the University of Saskatchewan. The leading theory on simulation sickness is that it's just the result of sensory conflict. As you said, it's this separation or the incongruence between what you're seeing visually, what you're hearing, and you know what you're actually experiencing in terms of your inner ear balance, right? In terms of the vestibular system. And having that crosshair in a video game, this provides this nice stable point of reference, it's kind of a reminder to, you know, your senses that no, you're not actually doing all of these things that are being simulated. You're sitting in your chair, you're sitting on your couch, you know, you're actually um, grounded in this, in this very real physical place. Now, this is something that game developers have struggled with for years. If any of you are familiar with virtual reality kits, for instance, you'll know that they're likely to make certain users hurl seconds after popping the headset on. I feel like that polygon journalist douchebag who couldn't complete the goddamn tutorial of Cuphead. Oh, he's kicking my ass. Go. Stealth mode, activate. That said, it's hardly limited to VR. I found a really interesting tidbit, which was that the developers of Mirror's Edge actually conferred with ballerinas about present preventing sickness when they're doing pirouettes. Um, and they discuss the concept of spotting, which is keeping your eyes fixated on a stable point of uh, reference. And that's kind of what the crosshair is, is a replacement for, is that stable point. Okay, so we can all agree that having a crosshair is important, and now possess more than just a cursory understanding of what function it serves. See what I did there? But the question remains, what makes one reticle better than another? Is it all a matter of preference, or is there truly some kind of god crosshair? Well, in an effort to find out, I actually consulted with another expert. One who actually makes a living by flicking to faces and, well, f***ing destroying them. I'll give you a hint. His interests include playing Counter-Strike on a StarCraft sensitivity, generally resembling a third grader who's sitting down for his school photo, and being a bona fide spin bot who boasts better spray control than the sprinkler on your front lawn. Elige. I asked North American Counter Strike's resident cutie pie whether he thought there was actually such a thing as a perfect crosshair. And to my surprise, actually, he said he thought there was. His. I think that I did find the perfect crosshair and I actually haven't changed it since I think 2017 or maybe late 2016. It's been years since I've changed this crosshair. And uh, I just think that it's perfect because it's like a color that I can just see on everything. And uh, I like that it's the draw outline 0.5 because it kind of gives me that outline, but it's also not extremely ugly where if you have the outline thickness at one, I don't know. I just think that I have the perfect crosshair for that. But that's to be expected, right? Like, doesn't everyone think that their crosshair is the be-all and end-all of bopping kids? 
Is there really a sense in which Allegiance is like objectively better or does it kind of all just boil down to what kind of player you are and what game you play? In Valorant, for instance, the only other esport in which all of this crosshair talk is really relevant, there's this emerging theory that smaller, more surgical crosshairs are in fact the tech. Why? Well, because you don't spray nearly as often as you do in CSGO and need to focus on, well, one taps. You disappoint me. One enemy remaining. What the stuff. Bro. <laughs> you cheating? You also don't need to memorize smokes in Valorant, so there's no need to make your crosshair big enough that it helps you execute lineups. And if and when you do decide to start dishing out Turbo Virgin Sova arrows, you can just make use of your actual user interface. And then I would place my left diamond right into this light bulb like this and do a one bar. And it's gonna look like this. Revealing area. So what this one does, it reveals garden but it also reveals people that will stand here, so you can actually assist your team peeking from B. What this has resulted in, of course, is some traditionally big cross-haired boomers, such as former competitor and FPS educator extraordinaire, nothing, to rethink what reticle feels most comfortable when playing Valorant. I think I use a small one just because you're not spraying as much, and I think it's two main reasons. One. You're not spraying as much, uh, you are encouraged to shoot smaller bursts and move more and kind of dance between shots a lot more. And then two, the game's more colorful, so I feel like I see the crosshair a lot better in Valorant just because everything is so uh, vibrant around the map, I just feel like it's easier to see it. Yeah, I think overall it's just the, the shooting style encapsulates the crosshair kind of for me in Valorant. Here's the thing though, you don't just see these tiny ass crosshairs in Valorant. Take the homie Rops for instance. Not only is Mouse Sports' Star Fragger one of the only top-tier professionals to have always kicked it in 16-9, but he consistently runs what is pretty much the tiniest f***ing crosshair I have ever seen. The result is a literal spec that has somehow earned him two consecutive spots on the HLTV Top 10. So how is it that Rops uses this thing to such great effect? Well, according to Dr. Klarkowski, it could be that he's just so well-versed in the intricacies of Counter-Strike that he doesn't need any of the other bells or whistles that other reticles bring to the table. So there's something, there's a concept in pedagogy, it's called instructional scaffolding. It concerns the gradual shedding of assistance by a teacher. The teacher can be obviously like a, a human being that is a teacher that's, you know, helping you with the task. In this case, I think it can also be the crosshairs. When we get to those really, really tiny crosshairs um, and we start to lose maybe a lot of the benefits that a crosshair can provide because instead we just have a single cyan pixel or a single pixel that is almost entirely transparent, we may find that those players, um, are, it could be a personal preference or maybe they're just better able to compensate for those micro cicadic movements or for, you know, thrift or for, you know, a lack of orientation. Maybe they're just able to or willing to compensate for that in, if that means, you know, a reduction of a tiny amount of visual clutter. There's also the question of outline, movement, and alpha to consider, which along with size, seem to create an inverse relationship between precision and visibility. There's this thing called micro saccades, and micro saccades are a involuntary jerk-like movement of the eye um, in which your eye just kind of, your eyes naturally drift to a nearby point of interest. And by providing this crosshair, you actually um, limit the tendency to drift to another point of interest, whether that's involuntarily um, or not. There is research out there on what, you know, the ideal fixation point in experimental design might look like. And the ideal central fixation point shape that they found was one that was very similar to a crosshair. It was like a crosshair bullseye blend. Um, and that was ideal in terms of uh, reducing the frequency of those micro cicadic movements. In other words, the bigger, more outlined and less transparent your crosshair becomes, the easier you'll be able to see it, both as you flick it around and as your eyes wander elsewhere on the screen. The problem is that a bigger crosshair can also be hard to hit shit with. 
While it's true that you won't ever lose track of the damn thing, having a big, bloated, well-defined reticle can also make it more difficult to perform careful, precise, exacting frags, especially at longer distances. What this does is force players to engage in a balancing act of sorts between the things that make a crosshair noticeable and the things that make it, well, usable. And it's because of this that they fall prey to what might actually be the single biggest pitfall with crosshairs. Our tendency to change them. It feels as if every day you see streamers, competitors, community figures, or just your everyday enthusiasts either tweaking their reticles or rebuilding them from the ground up. Hell, ESL even went so far as to produce an American Psycho-inspired skit parodying this phenomenon. New crosshair. What do you think? That's very nice. Look at that. Gave it a go yesterday. One on the thickness, zero on the dot, and one on the outline. It's great for visibility. The question, of course, is whether all of this fiddling is actually doing more harm than good. Whether the real problem with your reticle is your inability to pick one. Because, at the end of the day, if you're changing something all the time, how can you possibly expect to master it? I've, like, changed my crosshair maybe once over the last four years. And it's like, that's it. I, I have never changed my settings throughout being pro. And I, I think it's a very bad idea to change your settings unless you feel like you really need to do it. The reality is that crosshairs have kind of become so widely regarded as inconsequential and nipped and tucked so frequently as a result that they've kind of become the go-to thing to scapegoat whenever a frag goes awry. Because chances are you didn't whiff your shot because you opted for a .5 outline instead of no outline at all. Chances are it was you. Something you did, or better yet, failed to do. I think people only change their crosshair a lot of the times because they think that, if, oh, it's just a crosshair every single time. But I think that around that time when I did decide to use this crosshair, that was a time where I was like, I'm not changing this anymore. If I ever miss or mess up, it's my fault. And I'm just going to keep with what I'm at. And it helps me focus a little bit more and focus on what's really important. So if there's one takeaway from all of this crosshair talk, it's this. While it is true in some sense that your reticle is the most cosmetic feature of your config, that doesn't mean it needs to be the most chaotic. Stop fixating on how to improve your crosshair and instead start focusing on how to stick with it. Since at the end of the day, it's the player who makes the crosshair, not the other way around. I knew I had to work in the, oh, I forgot I'm sitting at a green screen. I can do the Elise photo. Just incredible. I have a version of Dimitri Elish photo now. It's perfect. Sheesh.